Aye. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brady Roberts with FMCS. I'll be facilitating this afternoon. Um, I just want to, uh, I do see your hand, Daniel, but I just want to mention that um, we have Carol in for proprietary institutions and Greg in for uh, dependent students. So welcome to the both of you. Daniel, go ahead. So I just wanted to return to one thought on the institutional liability, Jennifer, and reflecting over lunch, which provided me a chance to reflect, which I appreciate. Um, I am wondering if the department is willing to consider um, on the six year, three year issue, a carve out for those issues that pertain to record retention. So again, I, I personally would be in my constituent constituency would be supportive of six years if there were a carve out for those issues that relate to record retention specifically stated in the regulations. So three years for those that relate to record retention, six years for other issues. And I'm, I'm offering that as a potential solution to move us forward in good faith. And Daniel, just to add on there, I would be okay with that as well. That was one of the things I put it down. So if you're comfortable with that, Jennifer, what do you think the department would be? Thanks, Daniel. Misty. Uh, David, I see your hand too. I, I, I mean, it, it certainly sounds reasonable on the face of it. Um, I just wonder how many cases wouldn't involve some need for record retention. Um, yeah. Sorry, can I respond, David? And specifically what I'm referring to is the record retention relating to the making of or disbursement of the direct loan, which is the particular piece that is in stat is in regulation about um, the three year record retention. So, you know, to the to the extent of at false advertising or misleading job placement rates or other issues that may come up, those don't have the same three year uh, requirement necessarily. So in those cases, you know, again, I'm open to something different, uh, but specifically where in regulation, there's no need to retain beyond the three years. It feels um, uh, disingenuous to give people the option to discard and then require they provide the proof. So again, I'm trying to find a carve out that would meet the department's needs and the institution's needs. I just, I just want to make sure I understand what that would look like. So right now, um, we have proposed um, six years to recover from from the institution, and you're suggesting because we only require institutions to retain records pertaining to their financial aid disbursement of the students uh, of three years, that when we come back after the expiration of the three years, again, which institutions, that's just what we require. That does, there's nothing, I mean, institutions can retain their records beyond the three years as well. I just want to make that clear that that's you know, just something that we require, but certainly institutions are free to retain those records. That if we, if we go back and request records beyond the three years uh, related to a BD claim, that what, like what would, I'm trying so that we would not be. <laughs> yeah, so, so let me try to respond if I can. So, okay. so um, I think Misty's point is really valid. So in audits right now, we're being called to task for, for keeping records beyond the required retention period because of cyber risk. So at the same time, we're being asked not to retain records indefinitely. That's different than academic records. And again, I'm speaking specifically about financial aid records. So there is an audit risk for an institution as well as a security risk and a cybersecurity risk to keep those records beyond the minimum required retention period. So again, I make no, no comment or claim about the validity or ability of the department to cancel loans under borrower defense. My concern is specifically on institutional liability when again, an institution is not gonna be prepared to respond effectively and can't defend itself because of the of the timing issue. So, you know, the carve out may have to do with 
if the issue of the borrower defense is related to the making of the loan, then those that those portions cannot be collected from an institution beyond the period of the three years. Is that helpful, Jennifer? Yes, thank you. I will yeah. take it back. And thank you for fleshing out the um, the audit risk and the cybersecurity risk as well. Thank you, yeah, Joe. I think I just saw your hand, but then it just went down. Yeah, sorry, I'm hitting the button too many times. Just a quick point. Um, isn't the institution on notice once they get the request for response, not on adjudication, but on the on the borrower side? Right, so there's a request for a response that comes on the borrower side, and I think that should probably suffice to put the institution on notice that the department could come after you in the adjudication process. Yeah, Dan, you go ahead. I see you nodding. Go ahead. Sorry, um, Joe, can you provide clarity? So, so again, as I understood it, the borrower submits, let's talk about the application. Borrower submits an application. The department reviews the application and issues a request to the institution to respond. Are you saying there's a time before that where the school is asked to respond? And, and I, if so, I don't understand where that would be. Maybe I'm missing something. No, I, I think we're on the same page. Okay. Uh, so, yes, I'm just I, saying that that comes strategically and timeline wise before any recoupment proceeding. Yes, and so I agree with you. Once a request comes, then the three year waiver doesn't apply or the six year waiver doesn't apply if that request comes within the three or six year period. Uh, but I, my concern is a borrower comes back seven years or you know, to use the example, four years later, four years after graduation and says, the institution defrauded me in the making of my loan. And I'm using that as a rationale to submit my borrower defense to repayment. Um, there's no way for the institution to respond at that point. Uh, and, and simultaneously, Joe, if, if and this again goes back to the reason why I support Justin's request, or rather, sorry, Josh's request for timeliness. Um, if the borrower submits an application in year one, but the department doesn't approach the school until year seven, then that's not the school's fault. Um, and it's difficult at that point for the school who's not been put on notice. But I agree with you, once the, once the school has been put on notice and it's within the waiver timeframe, the limitation timeframe, they're required to respond. So I think we're, I think we're on the same page. Any, anything else on this topic? Um, thank you, all of you. That was that was helpful. Um, I, I want to quickly point out before we move on to the next issue that uh, John is at the table on behalf of uh, individuals with disabilities or groups representing them. So welcome, John. Um, Jennifer, are we ready for uh, issue paper number nine, pre-dispute arbitration? Yes. Okay, great. Let me just pull it up here. And actually, while I pull it up, we can um, we can have our Vanessa or um, our de the department pull it up. Oh, then they already did. Just <laughs> step ahead of me. Okay. Um, so just to recap. We did have proposed language during session one. Um, from what I recall, there was a lot of agreement um, about that language uh, regarding pre-dispute arbitration and class action waivers. Um, some minor comments and we went back and we addressed them. So let me just walk you through these. Um, basically, <clears throat> to begin with, um, we are looking at 685.300, which um, has to do with um, agreements between an eligible school and the secretary for, for participation in the direct, direct loan program. Nothing's changed in the general A section. Um, paragraph B under program participation agreement. Um, again, the regulatory text provides the terms of the program participation agreement or the PPA of a school that wishes to participate in the direct loan program. We just went back and um, B7, B10 are just kind of minor technical changes. 
Um, we added a B11, as you see there, just to conform with the changes we made um, about uh, redistribute arbitration and class action waiver rules that as a condition of its PPA to ensure that schools comply with the um, pre-dispute arbitration class action waiver rules regarding BD claims and disputes. Um, no changes under paragraph C. Paragraph D, um, this is what we provided uh, before. Basically, this is just reinstating the 2016 regulations in full. Remember, these were rescinded in 2019. Um, and the basic principle is that we wanted to ensure that schools cannot compel students to pursue a complaint about a BD claim through an internal dispute process. Um, and also that students would be able to present their complaint to an accreditor or relevant government agency. Under paragraph E, class action bans, um, some guiding principles under here is that, um, again, we've reinstated uh, the regulations that were in effect in 2016, um, except that we added um, that uh, verbiage of earlier of under E3, Romanet 3, clarifying the deadline by which the notice but must be made. Uh, paragraph F, pre-dispute arbitration agreements. Um, so schools will not enter into a pre-dispute arbitration to arbitrate a BD claim. Students, however, can enter into a post-dispute arbitration claim. So a reliance on a pre-dispute agreement with respect to a BD claim means it's included, but is not limited to seeking dismissal, deferral, or stay of a judicial action. Um, avoiding discovery or filing claim in arbitration. And um, some required revisions and notices is that the school must include in the pre-dispute arbitration agreement that include the following text. We agree that uh, for, for pre-dispute arbitration agreements already enforced and don't contain the above text, we must amend the PDA, the pre-dispute agreement to add text or provide the written notice to that provision. Um, and, you, and, and also to provide notice by the early of either the exit counseling or the day the school files this initial response to a demand for arbitration. So again, the only change that we have here since session one is under F3 Ruminant um, 3I, clarifying the deadline by which the notice must be made. Um, the new points, the, the very new concepts that we've integrated here, what we heard during session one um, is under paragraph G and H. Um, and this is based upon our discussion of regarding publication in a centralized database. Um, and that, that are were arbitral records that are submitted to the department. We had that in session one. Um, this committee or members of this committee have suggested that we go a step further and publish, publish those records in a centralized database. And we've incorporated that language here under G and then um, respectively under H for the submission of judicial records, um, requiring them to submit those records to us and also to publish, publish those records in a centralized database. Um, um, under paragraph I, we just clarify the definition of BD claim in response to the 11th Circuit ruling regarding Young versus Grand Canyon. Um, and then finally, we, well, that brings us to the end. We have some, um, let's see here. Yeah, I'll just, I will just stop there. Um, Vanessa, can you scroll down just a little bit? That's the end of the document. Yes, okay.
Do you want to take some um, comments and questions? Yes, that would be great. Great. Uh, and Vanessa, you could bring down the document. Thank you. Uh, I see Josh, go ahead. Thanks. So first of all, just reiterate um, how appreciative we are that the department is bringing back the pre dispute uh, arbitration and class action provisions. Um, these are, are absolutely necessary to ensure that borrowers are able to get full relief. Um, and in particular, I do uh, think that the change to the borrower de defense definition um, resolves kind of the biggest substantive concern as of, of the of the drafting of the prior version. And um, so very appreciative of that change. Um, on board with this, I do I, I, I do think that there are at least two ways it can be improved. Um, and we, you know we've been thinking a lot about one in particular questions of enforcement, um, because as of right now, um, a school that relies on a pre-dispute arbitration agreement or that fails to provide the required notice doesn't really face any clear consequences, even if the result is that the student's claims are improperly sent to arbitration. And one idea we had is that the department can make clear in these regulations that student loan borrowers are the intended third party beneficiaries of these provisions. Um, and we have some proposed language, which I'll drop into the chat in a second. Um, and, and I do want to make one thing very clear with respect to this language. Um, it wouldn't create a new right of action. Borrowers would be asserting pre-existing rights under state or federal consumer protection contract or civil rights law, um, but it would be providing a mechanism for borrowers to um, uh, use the provisions essentially as a shield in if the uh, school tries to compel arbitration. Um, and then the other kind of area where um, an improvement we think is possible relates to the required notice to the department um, if a school um, is going to try and compel arbitration or, or assert a claim directly in arbitration. Um, you know, I think I think I expressed last time that we've seen schools dispute that a set of facts could ever constitute a borrower defense claim, notwithstanding how it's defined in the provision. Um, and so we think that the provision should explicitly state that um, a claim concerns a borrower defense for purposes of these regulations if the plaintiff or any party in the action is asserting that this would constitute a borrower defense and that way it would be on notice of the provision. Thanks Josh. Carol, go ahead. I would like to request a quick 10 to 15 minute caucus with the accrediting agencies and uh, institutional representatives, please, both the primary and alternate negotiators. That's possible. Sure, we can get that set up. Yep, I believe Kayla is the host of the meeting, so I might have you um, repeat those names very briefly, just the, the constituency names, and then we'll okay. get that set up. The accrediting agencies, minority serving institutions, Financial aid administrators, bell agencies, two-year public colleges, four-year public colleges, private nonprofit, and proprietary schools. For my team, we're going to need to do that just a touch slower because all of these individuals have to be um, moved individually. So let's hold on for just a second. Emil, if you've got the groups, if you could read out the names, happy to take that. I think we could go offline and live while we sort this out um, and then we will plan on being back 10 in 10 to 15 minutes. So Emil, if you could read off names, that would be really helpful.
Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for your patience during that caucus period. Um, I wanted to turn it over to Carol, who initially called the caucus. Um, Carol, if you just want to come off of mute and um, feel free to, to speak a little bit. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody that participated in the caucus. Uh, Jessica and I have been working with our constituency on a proposal that we feel like would be um, in the best interest of our students. And I definitely appreciate the feedback that we received. So there is some additional data that we would like to gather. Um, so for the purpose of a temperature check at this point, we would probably vote no, but just know that that's because we are still, we would like to gather some more data and we are still working for towards a solution on a very, what we see as a very complicated issue. But I very much appreciate the feedback. Sure. Are, are you able to put that, that data request um, in, in the chat just so we have it as part of the transcript? Sure. Great. Thank you. And then uh, David, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so my concern is the extent to which the red, new red lines would extend to contracts with third party providers, OPMs, private contractors of the college and universities themselves. Um, we we know that there are examples of these contracts um, requiring pre dispute arbitration um, and attempting to pr protect the third party provider from lawsuits, class action lawsuits and the like. Um, and so um, we feel like it would be important that the language reflect the extension of these restrictions to uh, contracts and their contractors. Um, Thanks, David. And I just want to just note that Bethany is back at the table uh, for groups representing individuals with disabilities. Uh, so welcome back, Bethany. Uh, Brian, I see you just uh, came off of me. Yeah. I just want to respond. Yeah, just to respond to, to David. Um, as you know, there's a lot of litigation over the um, arbitration provisions and, um, you know, to be blunt, our language in 2016 is one of the few to survive um, litigation challenges. So my immediate reaction is I'm concerned about extending it to control contracts that don't directly relate to our programs. So if you can provide us some legal analysis, you know, taking into account, you know, the case law on arbitrate on the limits of agencies to limit the party party's rights to require arbitration, you know, we'd be happy to take a look at it. But my initial reaction is I don't see where we have the authority. Yeah, I will I will admit that it's not something I could provide immediately. Mm -hmm. Um and uh would need to recruit uh legal assistance. My um, my concern is the spirit of this regulatory language is to protect students' rights to legal paths that aren't limited to pre-dispute arbitration. That spirit is null and void if the contractors, if the contracts with the people actually providing these services are mandating pre-dispute mm -hmm. arbitration. So we, we, we lose the effect of the regulatory language via these contracts. Um, and so, yeah, I would be interested now or in the future um, working with the department to take uh, a serious look at this because um, more and more it isn't the institution that's delivering these services, um, it's a third party. Um, Thanks, uh, David and Brian. Uh, I see Josh's hand next. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I, I first want to um, echo David's concern, and but also completely recognize Brian the position that you just put forward, and that you know, at, at the end of the day, these regs um, 
have survived legal challenge. And so in a in a thorny area of law, you know, certainly don't want to do anything to risk that. Um, you know, I, I, I do think again, whether whether it's at this table or at a, at a future table, um, that the department should uh, not only evaluate its authority with respect to the topics that David mentioned, um, but we think that there may be a basis as well to extend to private lenders and in particular preferred lenders. Um, in addition to the same statutory provision at issue here, um, for ex by way of one example, 20 USC uh, 1094 subsection 27 um, might have some bearing on, on that issue. Um, again, also like David, happy to work on putting something together, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be at this mm -hmm. table, um, but would love to see um, as far as the department can go on that in the future, uh, we'd love to see it. I see Daniel next. Thank you. Um, I, to David's point, I, 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 um, I would be in support of it if we could define what provision of services means. So there are lots of third party contractors that are used by institutions of all kinds. For example, you know, we at Valencia have a contract with an agency to help students in uh, loan repayment manage their loan repayment and not wind up in default. Um, you know, is that, would that be subject to this? Um, if we use a third party for, uh, you know, uh, for um, aid, for ability to benefit testing, would that be subject to this? So, so at what point, um, you know, are we in control of those contracts? Uh, and could we as institutions dictate terms? So, you know, again, I'm open to this, um, David, but I want a much clearer definition of what that constitutes um, as, a, as a part of, you know, what is considered delivery of educational services under that, under that piece. Um, as, as, a, as a statement, right, um, our institution doesn't have any contract with students. So when a student walks in the door, the contract is, you know, is there in moment. There's no written contract that a student signs. So, you know, that I, I go back to the earlier conversation we had about the definition of a contract. Um, you know, I, I understand that they're making a verbal agreement or a non-written agreement, but, um, you know, I, I don't know and have, would have to review every single vendor contract about the use of arbitration under that um, under that piece. Joe, I see your hand, but David, do you want to immediately respond to? to yeah, that? I mean, yeah. <laughs> frankly, ideally, I would love for that to happen, for all the contracts to be reviewed and to see if they mandate pre-dispute arbitration, because I don't think mandating pre-dispute arbitration is ever um, on the face of it appropriate, right? Um, and so, um, and that that would be my initial reaction, of course. And that's just my opinion. But um, yeah, that would that would definitely be the goal. Um, and I, and I'm yeah, it's not so much the contract with the student, but the contract with the vendor um, that I'm referring to. And again, I, I don't I don't know, and we'd have to review whether, if I can respond, whether the the if there is arbitration required, is it arbitration with the institution? who is typically the consumer of the service offered by the vendor versus to your point, a private lender where the contract is about student service. So, you know, I think it would depend, it, it's a very fine point, but it would depend on the type of service being provided. Yeah, um, and I would be in cases where it's mandating pre-dispute arbitration involving the student would be what I'd be concerned about. Yep, thank you. Joe, no, go ahead. Yeah, I just I want to echo um, David and Josh's concern, and and I want to do that by raising a very specific specific example. Um, my colleagues in California are about to start a trial against uh, Bridgepoint Ashford for-profit school allegations of um, predatory conduct, including including predatory enrollment. Um, the parent company for Bridgepoint Ashford, Zovio, has now become one of these service providers, big contract with the University of Arizona. Um, and so I think you're seeing predatory actors move into this service provision space. And uh, although I agree, there may not be room to negotiate this right now, uh, I would urge the department to, to think about um, this issue and whether or not 
students um, are being mandated into pre-dispute agreements regarding services provided by these service providers because um, that's potentially problematic from um, an AG perspective. You know, we, we want um, students to be able to enforce their own rights. We don't want everything to fall solely to, uh, to law enforcement on these issues. And one, one last point um, to Daniel's comment about um, loan repayment providers. Uh, I'm not sure that this is specifically what Daniel's talking about, but another term for some of those actors is cohort, cohort default management companies. And um, we have grave concerns about forbearance steering with regard to those companies. Uh, something that I think Daniel's alternate uh, even raised the other day. So there's a lot of UDAP issues that AGs see with service providers and, and we would love to to help the department with an analysis of uh, you know whether this uh, pre-dispute um, issue uh, goes to those providers. I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but I think it's a, it's a great question raised by, um, by David and Josh. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, Jennifer, go ahead. I think you're muted right now, Jennifer. I was just saying, I appreciate this line of discussion. Um, and I don't mean to take us off of it. I just wanted to double check with Carol. Was Carol, Carol, was your request for data, was that for, for us or were you suggesting you needed to have further conversations with your constituency on this issue? No, we're, de we're determining that. I will let you know what um, data we like for you guys to provide. That's okay. We're going to meet on our next break. Sounds good. All right, so not seeing any other hands, um, and, and given that there's uh, uh, some potential data requests that need to be formed, and then as well as some proposed uh, language, uh, Jennifer, do you have uh, what, what you need from the department's perspective right now on this issue? Yeah, we just were eager to hear back from, you know, um, Carol and the institutions on um, if they need anything else further from us. And, um, you know, what their thoughts are. Um, that'd be great. So, so why don't we do this? Uh, if we could just do a quick temperature check on this and then we'll just take a quick 10 minute break um, uh, just to give some more time for that discussion and then we'll come back uh, with our next topic. So, um, if, oh, yeah, go ahead, Michaela. No, I was going to ask if after the break we were moving on or if we were coming back to that. <laughs> So no, I'm ready for IDR. If, right, right. I think um, if, if we're okay, a, a temperature check right now, um, given that there's a little bit still out there, and then a quick 10 minute break, and then moving into IDR. Um, so if that's uh, amenable to the group, could I see a, a show of thumbs on uh, issue paper number nine? Great, thank you everyone. And Carol, I see your thumb down and I know that we're going right into a break after this um, for specifically that, but is there anything else that you want to add to, to this discussion and this topic? No, we're wanting to collect a little bit more information for our proposal. Uh, great, so, so with that, I, I appreciate that conversation. Um, let's take a quick uh, 10 minute break and come back at 2.15 Eastern time. Uh, and we're actually going to begin with um, uh, Raj with, with a data presentation on IDR. So I'll see everyone then. Thank you so much.
Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience during that short break. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, before we turn it over to Raj for a presentation on income-driven repayment, I wanted to turn it back over to Carol. Thank you. Um, before we move forward, we just had a couple of questions regarding the reporting requirements that are proposed in the issue page, uh, paper number nine. Uh, we'd like to know exactly what data the department is requesting and then what the reason for the collection of the data is. And with that, what information does the department intend to publish publicly? It seems that there might be a privacy concern. Um, and we wanted to address that. And then um, we're also concerned that with the publication of this data, that it could present to be an inhibitor to prevent certain students from seeking to resolve issues as not wanting their personal information published. Jennifer, would you be able to comment on that? Sure, and here I believe you're referring to um, the submission of uh, arbitral and judicial records. I think the attempt here, um, and we discussed this during session one, really um, to you know get an understanding of of some of this, and really to kind of shine a light um, on on what these um, agreements and records look like. I think it's just it's it's just a matter of transparency, um, and there was a. A second question, I think about privacy, obviously subject to um, protecting privacy um, and we wouldn't be releasing any records with um, PII in it. Per personally identifying information. Great. Thanks, Carol, for that. And then anything that you want to pop into the chat as it relates to, to uh, pre-dispute arbitration, feel free to. Um, okay, we are at 2.20. I want to turn it over to our uh, advisor, uh, Raj Rolia, for his presentation on IDR. Um, and just as a reminder, we are a little over an hour out from public comments, so folks who are registered, um, try to log in a little bit early. But with that, Raj, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Brady, and thanks all for inviting me to, to talk about IDR again. Um, what I'm going to be doing today um, is trying to dive a little bit deeper um, into um, how we might think about some of the potential changes to income assessments and income protection, but not really thinking about who are the primary beneficiaries um, for some of these changes and, and thinking about folks who have different levels of income and debt. Um, what I want to, before doing that, just uh, tell you a little bit about the three supplementary documents that I included along with this presentation. So the first one is a, is a letter, um, or it's framed as a letter, but it's a report by the Pew Charitable Trusts. And so what I'm going to be doing today is trying to help develop some intuition about, um, again, changing some of these policy levers today uh, with different levels of income and debt. Um, but what they did um, is um, to give some examples of some of these policy changes, um, potential policy changes, such as changing income assessments or income protection levels, using historical data on kind of typical borrowing, um, typical income growth, um, typical debt loads for kind of exemplar students of a handful of different types. So somebody who's a non-completer, um, somebody who gets an associate's degree, somebody who gets a bachelor's degree, and somebody with a graduate degree. So <clears throat> the intent of that is to really try to take um, some of these conversations and put some more, um, more historical data on it. Um, whereas in these presentations, what I'm trying to do is not move too many things at the same time, right? So, so as we've talked about before, um, when you <coughs> change a lot of different inputs, household size, inflation assumptions, income assumptions, these can change the, the results um, in different ways. So what I'm trying to do in these presentations is sort of change one thing at a time um, so that you can see the effects of it. But that letter is going to give you some exemplars um, for um, some, some, some kind of typical borrowers, we'll call them, based on um, kind of good data 
on, um, again, income growth, income levels, debt levels, those sorts of things. The second document um, that um, I provided is a, we'll call it a summary from um, Dr. Leslie Turner, who's a professor at Vanderbilt. And this is um, in part, um, Joe um, mentioned last, uh, last session about um, wanting to see some research on things like, um, sometimes researchers call this choice architecture, um, but how do we encourage students to kind of opt in or get defaulted into the right, or get defaulted, I guess is not a choice necessarily, but if they, um, you know, which plan to choose, um, you know, helping folks get into the, to, to certain plans. And so what Leslie's put together um, is sort of a summary of what we're gonna call kind of the best research right now on some of the barriers. Um, again, some of this is gonna be uh, directly related to the IDR discussion. Some of it's just gonna be more broadly about repayment plans. And then the third piece is from um, Dr. Dominique Baker, who's a professor at Southern Methodist University. Um, and you know what I asked her to opine upon was specific challenges um, um, that students, minoritized students of color um, uh, face in some of the student loan programs. Again, part of it's gonna be directly related to um, the IDR take up issue, but some of it's more general than that as well. And so, you know, these are all outside documents, um, you know, whereas all of you have constituencies that you're representing, I'll say that I'm kind of trying to represent the constituency of researchers and, and, and data experts. And so this is me asking some experts on some of these issues to help, um, help provide some knowledge to the committee. I'm not gonna go over any of these documents in any sort of detail during the sessions, but I did wanna provide them to you. So, you know, you guys can have your, your light bedtime reading tonight. But that said, um, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and jump into um, the presentation. Today, we're gonna be talking about a, a new fictional uh, bar named Miles. Um, so some of the same caveats um, that we had before, um, these are illustrative examples, I'm not gonna incorporate things like um, common repayment offense like deferment or other things I can talk about where that might affect things in certain scenarios. Um, what I'm gonna show you is also some comparisons to the standard plan, but I'm not gonna model in here explicitly as whether somebody's eligible for that IBR plan or not. Um, and then as far as the inputs and assumptions, this is gonna be largely similar to um, the uh, example I gave in the last section, um, um, that bar was named Iris. Um, but for Miles, we're gonna look at a variety of different income profiles. And so the income profiles we're gonna look at is somebody who has a starting income of 15,000, starting income of 25, 35, 45. And 50. But the rest of those assumptions are gonna be similar to what we showed. So let's start <coughs> with um, um, uh, Miles, on the assumption that he makes $25,000 a year and has loan debt of $30,000. So in this first column here, standard repayment, this is gonna be the repayment that he would have under um, the standard 10-year repayment plan, would have a monthly payment of about $300. And based on some assumptions about income growth, again, about two and a half percent annually, the, um, he's gonna pay about nine to 14% of his income every month over those 10 years. On net, oops, sorry. On net, he's going to pay almost thirty-six thousand uh, dollars for this loan. Have zero forgiven and make one hundred twenty payments basically every month um, for ten years. The second column here is current case for IBR, um, and so this is going to be with income protection at one hundred and fifty percent and percent of discretionary income of at ten percent. As we saw last time, what this means is a substantially lower monthly payment amount. Again, that's going to change over time as Miles' income it grows over time. We're still going to take 10% of that discretionary income. If we think about how that, what that means as a percentage of gross income, he's going to um, pay about two to two and a half percent of his gross income every month for the for the for his total period. Um, he's going to pay much less um, than he would have under the standard repayment plan, but also have a big forgiveness amount of almost $37,000 at the end of those 20 years. As we move from left to right here, columns one through four, what we're gonna do is increase the income protection. So this is going 175, 200%, 250%, and 
I'm not going to go through all these in detail. We did something similar to this last session. <clears throat> but the one of the things I want to point out here is that the marginal benefit for miles at $25,000 a year and this student loan debt amount doesn't really change once we get to these higher levels of income protection. Because by the time we get to 200% income protection here in this column here, Miles effectively is making zero payments or zero dollar payments, right? Um, that's and it, uh, kind of in spirit is making 10% 10 per, 10 income share of those zero dollar, you know, or discretionary income. And in spirit is making $240 or 240 payments over those 20 years, but is not actually paying anything. So, so you know, if for example, there was a increase in the uh, per income protection from 200 to 250% for miles at these level, this level of income and, and student loan debt, there would basically be zero marginal benefit for miles at this income in this, um, in this scenario. So to try to summarize some of this information um, in a graphical form, and what I'm gonna do is add in um, some other um, income levels then as we go through, what I've done is basically plotted the amount paid here for miles um, at different levels of the income protection levels kind of an assumption. So we can think about here um, for miles making $25,000 a year, that's what that 25K means. Under the current plan at 150% income protection level, he's paying about $15,000 per year. That's gonna get progressively less until we hit 200% income protection level. And then again, as we go this way, um, and the income protection gets more generous, the marginal benefit for miles um, will basically be nothing kind of over time in that way. Okay. Um, and so this blue dash line here um, on this graph is the total amount paid under the standard repayment plan, just to give people a sense of, of what that is. So we can go ahead and start to then plot people, you know, fictional bars with, with similar assumed inputs, um, but different income levels on this graph. So for example, here now, um, the second line with the X's instead of the uh, um, circles, it's gonna be somebody at 50, making $15,000 a year. Again, with student loan debt at $30,000. As you can see is that at least in this range of income protection level, this person gets no marginal benefit for the most part from increasing margin, uh, income uh, protection because they're already gonna be having a discretionary income basically below the income protection level and therefore um, kind of no better or worse off if we raise income protection levels. Now, as we start to add people of higher incomes, this is the next person, this is somebody who's making $35,000 a year. So Miles instead is making $35,000 a year to start. As we can see here, this, this borrower is gonna get kind of benefits um, in lower amounts paid. Um, as we move farther out um, into the uh, protection levels um, as well. Um, sorry. What I'm going to show you next is a similar table to what I showed before, but this time um, for somebody making $45,000 a year. And I'll return to the graph here in a second, but I just want to show you something just to, again, develop some intuition on how we might think about some of these things um, with people of different income levels. So this is the person, Miles, again, Let's assume the miles starts at $45,000 a year, a year here instead of um, the 25 or 15 or 35. What we can see that is for some level here, we are going to have um, in, um, total paid increasing up until about 200% income level. And then it'll start to decline once it gets to an even higher amount. And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, one is you can see that as we have income protection in IBR, we're going to have lower monthly payments. And as we talked about before, what that typically does is reduce payments monthly, but extend the amount of time that somebody's going to pay those loans um, and extend the total amount that they would pay typically. And then as we get farther out for this borrower miles at $45,000 a year, the total amount paid is going to start to drop because we're going to start to forgive more um, loans as we get to the higher income levels as well. And in this case, actually, Miles ends up paying um, some interest only payments as well because the income protection basically drops his payment per month in some cases to below 
um, what is due for interest. And so what I put on here is that at very high income levels, what you can see is that the percentage of gross income, right? We're keeping the, the discretionary income at 10% for these, for these scenarios. The percentage of gross income ends up dropping um, to a pretty low level. Now, it's a value judgment about what's kind of too low or the appropriate amount of gross income. I just want to point that out so that's something you guys can think about as you make your decisions. So now we can plot this um, miles under the $45,000 a year income scenario <coughs> with this new chart. And as you can see, basically at some level, we'll have an increasing amount paid and then we'll have this benefit through um, lower total amount paid with the trade-off of potentially paying for a longer amount of time, paying more over time, or sorry, the total amount will be paid, um, but extending the, the repayment period. And as we get far to the right on this graph, again, what we're gonna see is potentially um, them making some interest only payments. And then um, we can put on a $55,000 a year scenario. And if we were to extend this out, you know, we could, you know, every time we add on more money, we're basically going to have lines that go farther out and farther out. Um, Daniel, I see your hand up. Why don't we, that's something I can answer quickly. Yeah, thank you, Raj. So one. just yeah. a quick question. Um, so I know in some income repayment plans, when your income reaches a certain level, if it's higher mm -hmm. than the standard monthly payment, you actually could pay more monthly than the standard monthly payment for repayment as well. But in this case, what you're showing, I just wanna make sure I'm clear, is the overall cost or repayment cost, including interest. So have yeah. you modeled for us, so you know, at some point, Miles is gonna earn a sufficient amount where his income-based repayment plan might, in fact, the calculated amount might be higher than the $300 standard. Do you have an example where that is shown as well? Yeah, that, I was actually going to get to that here just in, just in a minute. Um, but but so that's exactly right. And this goes to my um, sort of earlier caveat that you know there is sort of an eligibility um, um, consideration that could be applied here, which I did it for kind of putting together these graphs. And basically, for certain IBR plans, um, if your payment under the IDR exceeds that under the standard payment plan, you're you're basically not eligible for that. Um, and and in this bar. Um, I think it's at least these two data points here for when he makes fifty-five thousand dollars, if not more. I have some of the background I can I can look up here afterwards. But in this case, under the current sort of scenarios, Miles wouldn't actually be eligible for it. Um, but again, I'm not modeling that specifically. And 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 one of the reasons that um, you end up paying less actually as as incomes get income gets high, you know, if they were eligible, is because if you're paying just a, a larger amount each month and you end up paying for a shorter amount of time, right? And so because of that, um, you know, there, there are all these levers to pull. Yeah, I guess, I, and I, I go back to the question, is that true of all IBR current plants or IBR and ICR where you're not eligible if your amount is is higher than standard? Do we so know that? so I, I don't have the document in front of me right now. I don't believe it's el for all of them, um, I would have to go back through and kind okay. of look through. Never, never mind. One. Thank you. I'll hold that. Yeah. So another way we can think about this is just the average monthly payment as a percent of gross income. Um, and, and again, sort of the, the intuition I just want you to um, are trying to convey here is that, um, you know, when we talk about the percent of income, we're talking about percent of discretionary income as a policy lever that we can pull. Um, and so some of these um, income protection levels um, are what are going to what they're going to do is they're going to drive the sort of um, percent of gross income paid every month down to a relatively pretty low level. Now, again, um, that's up to the committee to decide about what what is sort of the, the appropriate level or, that you consider, but just wanted to point this out so folks kind of have that sense. All right, and so we could do a similar thing. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but um, instead of um, on the x-axis for these doing the protection level, we can do the share of income. And so just showing again, somebody who, you know, kind of the relative marginal benefits as we reduce the share of income that is assessed um, um, under potential policy levers. And again, for example, in this case, because this person with 15,000 
their income protection level is always going to be higher than their income, they're never going to have um, a total amount paid. They're basically just going to have a zero amount. Um, but there are benefits kind of for everybody else as you move right to left on these. Or sorry, left to right. All right, so the next thing I just wanted to go through was, was just some, some basic um, thoughts on what you might think about as you think about changing um, income share and or income protection. So, so we talked about last week, kind of both of these levers um, will reduce um, the amount, um, you know, uh, that a, a borrower might pay on a month to month basis. And so they can both do that. And again, one of the trade offs with that is going to be about repayment, repayment length, higher total amount paid. Um, and as I showed just now, at higher levels of debt, this could also mean that payments do not cover interest. But there are some different <laughs> differences that we might think about between raising income protection versus changing the income share. So all else equal, raising income protection is going to could lead to a larger number of what we might call quote unquote zero payment borrowers. And that's because the income protection can be higher than income, right? And as we showed in the last session, when income protection is higher than income, that basically means the discretionary income gets down to zero. Okay, so all else equal, that's going to lead to a larger number of zero payment borrowers. Um, but one of the things that, that I was trying to convey just now is that as the income um, protection increases to relatively high levels, especially relative to income um, itself, the benefits, the marginal benefits are largely going to accrue to a higher income level. Okay? Um, and so, you know, what I'm just going to mention here is um, encourage you to consider kind of the goals and design principles along two different dimensions. One is, are the goals to have what we might consider zero payments, like what we talked about, where discretionary income is effectively equal to zero, or affordable payments. And I know that's kind of a, a, a values judgment um, a term right there, um, but that might be something to question <laughs> to consider as well, right? So, so are you trying to get to zero payments or affordable? The second dimension you might want to consider goals is the is are the kind of the goals and the problems that you want to solve, right? So if the goal is to provide relief to existing borrowers, and obviously revised repayment plans and some of these forgiveness options and other things you guys are talking about during these weeks are obviously critical. What I'd like for you to also keep in mind is there is a secondary goal, or not secondary, but a, a second goal that you might um, want to think about as part of this, and that's not just providing relief to existing borrowers, but also encouraging future students to be able to participate and succeed in higher education. Okay? And so, you know, I teach full sessions and classes on this, and so I'm not going to go through it all um, <coughs> today, but to encourage those types of things, the investments we're typically going to want to make are in other areas outside of student loans, such as lowering the price of college, increasing grants, and doing other things that facilitate, um, you know, uh, access to and success in college. And so obviously these are not mutually exclusive goals, um, but uh, you know, I encourage you to think about that to the extent that there are limited resources, you know, thinking about where you would want to invest. In and so what I want to share next then is just how a, a way that I've been thinking about um, sort of changing potentially these levers um, in um, both the income assessment and the percent of the poverty. And though maybe this is just for me because because I'm a huge nerd, but like if I think about this sort of similar to uh, our tax system, um, this is actually somewhat beneficial. And, and, and so it, at least conceptually in thinking about it. And so we can actually think about the current IBR plan as similar to sort of a marginal or progressive tax system. And effectively, we can think about it as for the first you know, 150% of the poverty line of income for this person with a household equal to one, um, it's going to be about $19,000. The marginal assessment rate on that each dollar there is 0%, right? And then once you exceed that 150%, you're going to jump up to a 10% um, marginal tax rate or assessment rate on this. Okay? So, that, you know, for those of you who follow um, tax policy, these types of graphs are going to be pretty simple. So what we can then do is think about <coughs> what happens to this graph if we change some of these levers, right? So here, this is that 150% protection level, um, uh, income protection level that I, that I just showed. What we can say then is if we move to 200% of 
of the poverty line protection level again, holding everything else equal. What we see is we're shifting to the right kind of who is covered, right? Who basically has how much income is covered um, or, you know, is by, uh, by the protection, right? We're kind of shifting that amount to the right. But then everybody up here is effectively unchanged. Right? Again, we can kind of move this out again, moving it to the right. So every time we kind of increase the income protection, you know, especially using the poverty line, we're kind of shifting these out to the right. Okay? We can also think about the income share in a similar way, right? So this is going to be a 10% income share in this way. And in this case, we could lower it. And what we're doing is shifting things down. Okay? So in this case, sort of everybody in this region is the same. But in this region, there's a benefit of getting their income share shifted down um, from 10% to 7.5%. And again, we can shift it down to five. Okay? So how I conceptually can think about this um, is the income protection is basically shifting, you know, these these kind of tax schedules or these income assessment schedules on the um, on the x axis, and the income share is shifting it on the y axis. And so one of the things, um, just that is I think potentially an option for you is changing both of these at the same time, right? Where you can shift both on the x axis and the y axis. And we can think of this akin to our, again, to kind of draw a corollary to our income tax system, a progressive tax uh, system, where for certain levels of income, you're charged a rate, but that rate increases, that marginal rate increases as your income gets higher, right? And so in this case, that again, to kind of go back, this is our current scenario where there's just kind of two levels here. In this next scenario, what you can see is you could basically put in some cliffs in here where, you know, for the first 150%, somebody's taxed or is assessed at 0%. From 150 to 300% of the poverty line, the assessment is 5%. And then it goes up to, you know, the current 10% over 300%. And these are just examples here. Um, and you could um, potentially, you know, again, get as, get as sort of complicated as you want. In this case, um, Scenario two, you're shifting out um, the income protection out to 200%. And then again, sort of this progressive tax schedule um, throughout the rest of the, um, the, the income distribution up until 300. So just some conceptual benefits of this. Um, you know, one of the reasons we have this in our, our um, in our income tax system, it should provide little to no incentive for somebody to have a higher income, right? Because it's a marginal tax rate. Um, and then it also takes into account kind of both dimensions of vertical and horizontal equity. Um, the vertical equity being what I mentioned before, the payment grows, um, the marginal uh, assessment grows as ability to pay grows, but there's still horizontal equity in that kind of people with similar um, income levels are assessed the same amount for that amount. And so because of that, um, another way that you might think about um, pulling some of these levers as, as you think about the IRS. And so that's it that I have today. I have some additional figures and tables that you can look in there for yourself um, and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Raj. Uh, we'll turn to Michaela first. Kind of a question for Raj, but overall, like this talked a lot about monthly payments, um, but there hasn't been any conversation about what it would look like to shorten forgiveness time that like folks with a zero or even very low balance will still end up with this on their credit and unable to seek economic mobility for 20 to 25 years. Like that's, and so I'm I'm wondering how that, that plays into this. And then I also just kind of begs the question, I guess is why aren't we told what like we're working with? Like, you know, we make mention of, you know, the cost and things, but how can we make decisions on if we should shorten time or look at affordability when we don't know what that larger picture even is. It's like we're making mystery suggestions when it comes to IDR. Okay, Persis. 
Yeah, so I think, I mean, first of all, I think Michaela raises really good points. And I think that, um, you know, a couple of pieces of data that we also don't seem to have is what is affordable, right? Like that is a piece, what, what does it actually cost to live um, is a piece that I feel like is missing um, from what we have and how does that vary by a different population. But one of the more specific questions I have um, about the presentation is as you're talking about the, the difference between somebody who makes below 150% of federal poverty and someone who makes above, I mean, certainly, uh, and maybe I'm misunderstanding what it means to, to have the marginal rate. Um, and so maybe just to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly, right? Like a person who makes 150% over, over the federal poverty level is not paying 10% of their entire income. They are paying 10% of the amount that is over 150%, right? So it doesn't, like I think, like the cliff, I don't think see that as a bit of a clip, right? So like if you make a thousand dollars over, you know, that you're not paying, you're now not paying like thousands more dollars a month, you're paying 10% of just that amount that is over uh, the 150%. So um, that I'm not sure if I understood the graph correctly, um, but I wanted to clarify that point. So your your interpretation is correct, right? It is a margin. It is a marginal rate. There is a, a kind of a graph. At the end of your presentation and the supplementary um, the additional figures that, that might get to it a little bit more in the way that you're thinking about it, which um, shows that yes, it's not it's, it, it's going to be an assessment above the income right above that amount. And so it's still a marginal rate, as I mentioned in that presentation, absolutely. And that graph kind of shows that it's not as if like a bunch of people are just um, getting that applied to them and others. Or not. It's, it's kind of everybody's first 150% of the poverty line income is, is, is kind of assessed at zero, and then there's a marginal rate. Uh, Bethany, go ahead. So related to both um, Michaela's and Persis's questions, it seems to me that if we're going to be making these decisions, we should be thinking about borrowers who may be likely to go into default or borrowers that, you know, we. I, I would like more information about the borrower population, but that being said, I want to just acknowledge we are on day four. We are almost out of time today, and this is we're just starting on IDR, which seems like we're giving it a good deal of short shrift. So just if we are going like for week three, I really think we should think about starting with IDR, given we've given it short shrift both of these weeks. Um, but just registering that I think, you know, it's a lot easier to make these decisions about real people if we have information about those real people, and um, that would be helpful. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to, do you want to, I, sorry, I saw your actual hand. Do you want to respond? No, um, all that. I was flagging my hand for something else. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, any, any other questions for Raj at this time? Oh, so, sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Um, so I just also want to, um, I guess, add to what Bethany shared. So I think it was easy. So first, thank you, Raj. <laughs> Yay, research. Um, so it was really clear to sort of see from what you shared, right, sort of these um, really low earners and maybe low mid earners. Um, and I think one of my questions or concerns are like, what does this look like for folks who are in the middle, and I know middle looks different depending on like region and, and all of the things that we've we've talked about before. But I, when I think about how many of the folks gave comments who aren't necessarily right in this like completely right, they're about to default, but in fact have been making payments for years, so there's some income, but there's still an issue. And and so I think I, I don't want to ignore sort of this. Right, we often ignore the middle, and so I don't know if there's maybe additional information that would be helpful. And I, I do sort of understand um, what you shared, right? If we sort of increase this and 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 what we see, and I guess maybe when we're thinking about um, maybe additional examples, that would be helpful as well um, to kind of see how these payments end up either increasing over time or bars are sort of paying more. And I think Dana made a. a, a um, comment in the chat about right capping income. So it helps to have these examples. And if we, you know, do, when we do come back to this, I think that would be helpful for me to see. Thanks, Marjorie. And I'm seeing um, the request coming in in the chat. So, Daniel, why don't we go to you and then provide there's nothing else for, for Raj? We can turn it over to the department for um, the first part of IDR. 
Thank you. And, and maybe this comment is better served in the next portion, but I, I think it's important because it speaks to the data Raj presented. I have, a, I have a paradigm question around the purpose of IDR, which is, is it to protect borrowers who are already in low income situations or to protect a borrower who may find themselves at some point in an income situation that's untenable? So to make payments. So the reason I ask that is, um, you know, the period at this all, it, it feels like this all coexists in a world where we're talking about PSLF, where we're talking about loan forgiveness for the period of time. You know, I'd love to see a world, and maybe this is just not the paradigm, I'd love to see a world where a borrower could opt into IDR or IBR, even if their current income isn't qualifying them to make a lower payment with the protection in place that would allow them if they lose their job, if they um, you know, don't get raises, if et cetera, et cetera, there is a protection for them in that time frame, and have those years of standard repayment qualify. So I think this is the problem is that we're, we're somehow you know, um, deconstructing the current situation of the borrower from the payment option they have. And in, whereas in fact, really it's the premises that IBR and ICRs protect the borrower, we should let borrowers opt into that from day one, so that if in the future they have income risk or income volatility, they're protected because they're in that payment plan. And I guess, Raj, this goes at, you know, to the question you raised about sort of where they come above and beyond. And uh, the one I was talking about in terms of the standard repayment cap, um, you know, I'd hate to see a borrower asked to pay more than the standard amount, but I'd still want them in there for protection purposes and for PSLF qualification and for, um, for you know, cancellation qualification. So I don't know if that's just a paradigm difference or, you know, that isn't in terms of what the department has even envisioned for, for income based from payment plans, but it seems that, you know, that would be sort of a, a generalized one where we want everyone to choose that to help protect them for future exposure. So, um, so, so let me just give a quick response and I'll, I'll let you continue to deliberate on some of these issues. So I think these are all great questions. You know, I'm certainly happy to, to provide what I can on this. Um, it sounds like a lot of the questions are not necessary. So, so what I've tried to be tried to think about are, are kind of a policy levers that were put in the, the issue document and, and what happens if you change some of them. It sounds like um, there's still some thirst for some information just even on kind of uh, distribution and, and demographics of borrowers more broadly. Um, I can try to certainly put that together. What is not going to be possible, at least with the data that I have, something that kind of specifically links that to sort of different IDR plans or where they are in the, you know, uh, I see Bethany put a comment in there about sort of where they are relative to certain income thresholds and things like that. That's going to be very difficult to do, um, you know, again, with, with public data. And so some of these things I think are, are, are great questions, um, but I'm not sure if they're, they can be done even, um, you know, produced by the department. Thanks, Raj. Dixie. Yeah, Bethany just commented in the chat and it was something that I was going to ask. Is there something that the department could do to help Raj with that? I know that I've asked, I asked yesterday um, and Raj got back to me and just said that like there are concerns with um, data sharing and stuff like that. While I understand, I think that this data request would be incredibly helpful for the negotiators, especially myself, trying to understand it because we're, we're just dealing with like possible examples, right? And so it would be helpful if Bethany's data request in the chat could be fulfilled in just like halfway fulfilled at least. And so um, can the department help with that? Um, is there a way for Raj and our advisors to get um, data that the department has? Um, so yeah. Yes, and thank you um, for getting the chat, Bethany. Uh, Persis, and then if you don't mind, I, I do want to turn it over to Jennifer so we do have some time to discuss this today. So I, I want to reiterate this point, and I actually did make a data request um, after week one um, to this effect, asking for race data, asking for breakdowns of borrowers in different repayment plans um, to break it down by race where possible. And, and I think that 
I'd like, I'd like us to expand our idea about what is possible. I understand that the Department of Education does not capture race data um, when it when it gets its um, federal student loan data, but there are other ways of approximating race. And, and candidly, I have FOIA this, this particular question numerous years in a row. So the fact that the department um, doesn't currently have the data in time for this rulemaking doesn't really seem like a great explanation for why this data does not exist. I think that there are proxies that we can use um, in order to estimate what uh, what the impact of the different um, different payment amounts are, you know, how many borrowers have zero dollar payments, how long are they in zero dollar payments, does that impact different race groups differently? We can do that by zip code, we can do that by, you know, approximations of last names. These are proxies that different agencies do use. Um, and certainly I think the department should be doing that analysis on a regular basis. And I think that we need that data in order to really be able to create reasonable rules based upon real life examples of how our student loan system is impacting um, borrowers, but especially borrowers of color. Thank you, Persis. Um, so at this time, again, thank you, Raj, so much for that for that presentation. Um, at this time, Jennifer, are you, you uh, am I able to turn it over to you to present the first section of uh, uh, IDR proposed reg text? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Um, and thank you again to Raj. We did ask him specifically to talk about um, the income and an income share and how that plays out. I think that really helps to inform this discussion as we go into it. Um, as far as the data requests, we have received several. Um, given that this is a compressed time frame that we're dealing with, um, we're trying to prioritize those requests. If we don't have those data, we there's not we can't pull it at this time if, if we if we simply don't have the data that's being requested. So we are reviewing those, we are pulling them. Um, and you know, to the extent that they're available, we will provide them um, as they from these discussions at the table. I see some hands raised, so I can I was gonna say, yeah, Dixie and Bruce this year, and Dixie, go ahead. Yeah, so I I just wanted an answer to what I asked yesterday and what I asked today. Um, literally a while ago, 10 seconds ago, basically, um, what data can the department actually share with Raj so that he could better fulfill those requests? Because that's what I'm really confused on. And yesterday when Raj and I were chatting in the in our chat, I understand that there are data sharing concerns, very valid. But we also have to figure out a way that we can fulfill those data requests because some of the stuff that we're asking for, that data does exist. And so I for me, it would be incredibly helpful to helpful to figure out how is a department actually helping Raj fulfill those requests, fulfill his entire duty as like an advisor to us. So that's what I'm confused about, because if the department is not helping Raj with any data, then he's left with just public information. And we've seen that like we're requesting data and it's not being fulfilled because there is not any public data, but also like we're asking in specific data about the department, right? And some of the data the department does to collect. And so I want an answer to what the department is doing to help Raj actually fulfill those data requests and how there are other advisors as well. Um, I'd really appreciate an answer before we move on. Thank you. Thank you, Dixie. Um, well, first, we we really value Raj's role here, and he, I think he's provided us with invaluable information throughout this um, throughout this session uh, and the session before. So we would never want to feel like Raj is left in the lurch, and we're asking him uh, to fulfill these um, tasks without the proper um, support. So, um, and he's delivered every time. So. We will talk to Raj. Uh, we have been talking to Raj. So uh, to the extent that Raj needs information and data to kind of fill out some of this information, we are here to provide it. Where we can't provide it, we will express that as well. 
I also want to make clear that I want the my comments to be framed into a way that I don't appreciate Raj's input. I do appreciate his input. I appreciate his expertise. And Raj and I talked about it yesterday, so that's not what I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to get at is that I I think it's very clear that I think Raj may need more uh, more support from the department, and he's been doing an amazing job thus far. But I think that. And I don't want to speak for Raj, but for me as a negotiator, I would like the department to support our advisors to the fullest of its capability and its capacity. I don't think that's just happening right now. And I don't want the conversation or the department to frame what I've said and what other negotiators have said as we're not appreciative of Raj and Heather's time because that is further from the truth. Raj's time and his expertise and Heather's expertise has been incredibly helpful for someone like me where I'm literally learning as I'm doing this yes. and it's been incredibly helpful. So I don't want that to be the case um, and I'm really thankful for both of them, but I also want the department to help them as well so that they can help us. 100%. I think we're on the same page. I wasn't suggesting you were saying that at all. I think we're all um, very appreciative of the work that our advisors do and if we've been, we, we're here to support um, them and giving them the information so they can present it in a way that's uh, informative for this committee. So thank you for your comment, Dixie. All right, thank you everyone. So we have um, under half an hour left. We want to invite members of the public um, in for the comment period. Um, now you have a lot of uh, documents as it relates to IDR. Um, so you should have just pull up my list. Uh, you should have uh, not only the department paper number 10, but uh, I know that Persis, Persis and Josh sent out um, four documents and you, you should have one just now in your inbox, as well as um, the two requests from Raj. And I think for this first section, we're just going to look at sections A through D in, on, on uh, issue paper 10. So that's uh, section A general through which is loans eligible to be repaid under an IDR plan. Yes, this is if we could cue that document. This is a proposed regulatory text for issue paper number 10 income driven repayment plans. And there it is. Thank you very much. I see Michaela's hand up. Um, perhaps we should Get to her if she had something before I guess. Do you want to do you want to say something before we before we dive into this? Just super quick, especially like since we only have a few minutes and like gearing up for tomorrow. If the department had the opportunity or plans to look at versus uh, proposal and have a maybe a reaction to that, because I think that that is a different construct than what we currently are looking at. And so if that is up for consideration, I think that maybe we should address that a little bit. Sure, I mean we could we could start with that. Um, I could I mean I can share back what we have, um, which is not a whole lot other than um, in terms of putting a bar on default in one of these plans, we agree that yes, that is possible, but I think we need more information um, in terms of um, you know, once they're in one of these plans, uh, we know at least for ICR um, that they couldn't receive forgiveness. A defaulted borrower would not be able to receive forgiveness on an ICR plan. And I'm just wondering um, that the statute is pretty clear on that. And, um, you know, our general counsel's office is prepared to speak on that, but I didn't know if there was something more there regarding your proposal from legal aid versus that you can kind of flush out a little bit more. And I'll stop there. So yeah, I, I see your hand, but person, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so I, I'm happy to speak to that. So certainly I think, right, we have two different statutes that provide cancellation uh, uh, or provide income repayment. Um, and so I think it's actually quite clear that the income-based repayment um, statute does allow for cancellation um, when, for defaulted borrowers who are in there. I also think that there there is a reading of um, 
the ICR statute that could possibly allow for defaulted borrowers. I recognize that there, the provision in ICR 7, uh, in 7A of that section says that it, it there's an including, there's a list of, of payment plans that do qualify and it says that, you know, will include time when a borrower is not in default and pays under these various different places. But I, I read the word include and I think Merriam-Webster also reads the word include to say that when you include something, it's not an exhaustive list. So I think that there is actually space that one could provide cancellation um, to, to borrowers who are in default. Um, but I think, I mean, I think the, the most important thing is to ensure that when borrowers are in default, they, they are not paying hundreds or not thousands of dollars more than they would on an income sharing payment plan. I'd like those payments to count for cancellation as well. And I think that there is a legal avenue for them to count for in, in that way. But I think the most important thing is to ensure that we're not taking thousands of dollars from borrowers who are expecting the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, you know, counting on it to pay back back rent and fix their car and get to work. So, I mean, I think that there is both a question about the payment that is made and making sure that those are affordable for borrowers, but I do think that there is a legal path forward as well um, on how we could get those borrowers time towards cancellation and ensure that they're not in a lifetime of debt. Unless the department wants to respond to that point specifically, I'll, uh, Daniel, go ahead. So this is just a blue pie, blue, blue sky, apple pie, uh, uh, something like that. Uh, question, is it possible, I know there's been conversation about auto enrollment, is auto enrollment in, in IBR off the table? Um, is there anything in statute that would pro prohibit that? Brian's raised his hand. I think that's yeah, it. Brian, Brian, go ahead. Oh, you're muted right now, Brian, sorry. I'll respond to both. Um, first, in regard to Persis's comment, um, our reading of the statute is that payments made while borrowers in default do not count um, towards the 25 years for forgiveness under the ICR plans. That's been the department's consistent interpretation since the ICR statute was enacted back in 1993. Um, we don't see a basis for changing that interpretation at this point. Um, we understand that there could be a, a different reading, but we don't think it has enough support. Um, we appreciate and certainly agree with your second point about, you know, the amount of, of the payment that's being required from borrowers in default. I think there are other ways to address that and, um, you know, that's part of what's at the table now. Um, in regard to Daniel's comment about automatic um, enrollment in an IDR plan, um, first of all, uh, the statute gives the borrower the choice of repayment plans, um, at least a borrower who is not in default. Now, um, the statute does give the department the authority to require a borrower who's in default to repay under an ICR plan. Um, the problem until recently is that, and, and to some extent it's still a problem, um, we can't put anybody into ICR without effectively their consent because we need their income information. Um, now we do have uh, a process moving forward with the IRS as authorized by Congress to get that information, but we will still need borrower consent. Um, it's not that we get that the IRS will give us the information just on our say so. Uh, Can I respond to that, Brian? Sorry. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I mean, one option would be to redefine what is standard. So, in a sense, the the department makes a choice by putting people on a standard repayment plan. Borrowers don't have to choose the standard. That is that is something that they're defaulted into, lack of a better word, um, or pushed into. Um, so one option would be to make the standard repayment and ICR and IBR process once the department irons out the the um, access issue in terms of tax information. Um, you know that that could be a way to address that concern. And again, I go back to the question of protecting borrowers. I think. 
you know, that that would generate the, the, the best protection for borrowers from the front end. Borrowers could choose a different payment plan if they wanted to, but, it, you know, and, and I'm not interested in restricting borrower choice, but I am interested in nudging people into the payment plan that's going to be most beneficial for them long term. Well, and that's that's a legitimate point. I, I don't dispute that. Um, I mean, I think there's some debate as to what is in the best interest of borrowers overall, whether to go into an income driven plan or if they can repay in 10 years, just get rid of the debt. Um, I mean, that may depend on amounts and it may depend on the borrowers individual situations. I and think again, that, that's why that's why the data question shows, you know, there's a lot of difference differences among borrowers. And that's why I raised the question of an IBR that would allow a cap at the standard 10 year payment amount. So in, the, in a sense of if a borrower reached income threshold that would be too mm -hmm. high, they would make that standard payment anyway. So just something for consideration. Mm -hmm. okay. And Persis, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I had, uh, well, two things to say in, in response to both of those things. Um, so first of all, to, to Daniel's um, point about automatically enrolling folks in IDR, I want to, I'm going to put this in the chat right now, um, but New America actually published a blog post yesterday with, um, with a proposal on how under the Future Act we can get at least delinquent borrowers automatically enrolled into income during payment. And I know that um, as we're going through our proposed regulatory text, I think this will come up towards the end as we're looking at the procedures, um, but I think that it's worth, uh, I think it's worth consideration for folks to take a look at this New America um, proposal and for when we're getting there as a way to provide that consent necessary under the Future Act um, so that we can actually can get, we can do it through the master promissory note, we can do it at other points um, when borrowers are interacting so that we can get that consent so that we can enroll borrowers who have a demonstrated, you know, demonstrated financial hardship by not making payments right and get them into income during payment so i i recommend that folks take a look at that um i suppose that's maybe my guess my fifth document or proposal that i'm sending you all on income during payment um but the the other thing is to go back to uh brian's point he said that he thought that there were other ways that we could get to the payment amount of um, defaulted borrowers and that that's what's on the table now and i was hoping that we could get a little bit more detail about um, what, what you meant by what we're talking about now and how that would uh, cap the amount of payments that defaulted borrowers are required to make. I don't want to get into the details until um, uh, Jennifer has a chance to go into more of the, the, the details of the plans that we put forward there. Um, I think there's a lot of discussion still to be had on on the details of those programs and how they'll be available to defaulted borrowers and the departments continuing to look at at that and the options we can provide to defaulted borrowers. Um, some of that might be on the table now. Some of it you'll see before the third session. Um, and then uh, so I see Michaela, but then after that, I it might be appropriate to transition to looking at the uh, the reg text, but go ahead, Michaela. All right, I just had kind of another follow up just to be able to conceptualize. I know we go through it piece by piece, but um, you know, I think this time forgiveness piece is really, really vital right now. And here it's like 20, 25 years, right? That's a lifetime of debt. And when you have folks that are going to have a zero payment, for years and years and years, it also increases the odds that they're just going to stop refilling out that paper every year and end up in default because what's the point, right? I'm going to owe this forever. forever. Like like in the criminal justice world, that's a literal life sentence, 20 to 25 years. Like people have kids that go to college and like, how are they going to pay for their kids to go to college while they're still paying their own student debt? Like. It's like I'm hearing this constantly. Y'all should stay off Reddit for student loans while you're doing this because it's really, really triggering. Like the stories that folks share, it's just like you can't buy a house. How do you get an apartment? This is on like even when you're low income, like you can't get housing. A lot of folks that are in the lowest, you know, these really low, low income earners didn't complete their degree, right? So they don't have a way out of this ever. So, and I'm I'm honing in on this time to forgiveness because I don't understand why we can't drastically lower it for the lowest of wage earners 
right? Like have it be like, if you have a zero payment for seven years, then it's forgiven. Like, why do you have to wait 25 years when you're never going to get money out of them? <laughs> or like, why, why is it 20 years? Why, why can't it be 10 for, for folks on an IDR or under a certain income? And, and if that is on the table, if we have to prioritize monthly payments versus time to forgiveness, if we don't know where those pressure points are and what, what y'all have as far as like what you all are, are willing to expend, then how can we have a real conversation about how we're weighing these value decisions? Like, because cool, you give somebody $20 off the bill for 25 years. Like, I, I, I'm really struggling with how we can look at this piece by piece without knowing what these pressure points are and what we can actually do here. It's 20 years is insane. Thank you, Mika. I, I appreciate that comment. I, I do I do want to give Jen the time to run through the document though first because I understand there are big questions, but I, I just want to give this the, the proper timing. I know we're only we're under 15 minutes out from public comment, so you can't really fully dive into this today. Um, but if we just gave uh, the department the opportunity to, to tee that up for us. Um, but while that's getting pulled up, I do, I do just want to remind we've had the first folks log in for public comment. Um, but again, if you, if you did receive a confirmation email to speak, um, please, if you wouldn't mind logging in early, just for the folks on the live stream end of things. Thank you, Brady, and thank you, Michaela, for your comment. I think um, we're going to get to that conversation um, as I introduce the proposed text. We flagged by TK, meaning to come. Those are areas that we want to discuss with you. Um, so to the extent that you guys can um, frame your comments uh, in terms of priorities for your constituencies within the IDR framework. Um, so I understand, Michaela, that this uh, the, the years to forgiveness is something that you flagged. And for purses, the defaulted borrowers, we've, um, I prefaced our response to purses uh, saying that we just we simply haven't where where we can't do it, where we feel like our legal analysis resulted in a reading where we can't do something, um, we're limited. We believe by our legal read, as Brian mentioned, there are still some policy issues that we're taking into consideration, but certainly the conversation regarding defaulted borrowers of the department is ongoing. So to the extent that we can integrate this as we go through the proposed language, I um, do encourage you to do so. Um, so this is uh, in a new section 685.209 proposed text. There was a question earlier on, um, I think after we provided this for a mandatory text, red line text. Um, and just to clarify, um, in introducing the new uh, income contingent repayment plan, we have taken the opportunity given and the understandable confusion regarding all the regulations and existing plans to redo the whole section, redo the whole section, rewrite everything um, in terms of the existing plans, restructure that. There's nothing substantively changing um, with regard to the existing plans, but in integrating our new proposed um, plan and language, we decided to revamp this whole section. So this, this is the mandatory text to replace existing text um, under 209. And just to recap for income driven repayment plans, when we talk about income driven repayment plans, it's the umbrella um, nomenclature for four existing plans. And then the fifth, uh, fifth one that we're proposing that you see there under five, um, and just to, just to read the, them out, out loud, we have the income contingent repayment plan, income based repayment plan, pay as you earn or pay and repay. Um, we are proposing the expanded income contingent repayment plan or EICR. That's how we're referencing it in this proposed document. We are amenable to um, that name as well, and we're, we're happy to take suggestions on what to call it. 
Um, so please join in on that. So again, TK, right off the bat, other definitions that we feel are relevant to um, subpart B. Um, currently we have um, essential definitions regarding partial financial hardship. And again, this is pulling in definitions. All of this is pertinent. It may not be pertinent to the proposed plan, the EICR, as, a, as we're temporarily calling it, um, but, but it's in there because remember, we've collapsed all these plans into one section to simplify. Okay, so there's partial financial hardship. I think um, to Daniel's question, this applies to um, IBR in terms of income requirements. Um, eligible new borrower, uh, what that means, and we've where we've embedded in the definition is to what repayment plan it is applicable to. Uh, new borrower means for the purposes of IBR plan, for example, eligible loans for the purposes of proration, um, discretionary income. We've talked about this a lot. Again, means for the ICR plan, difference between the applicable total income determined in accordance with, with subsections E and L and 100% of the applicable poverty guideline for, and that's applicable for IBR, pay, repay, and EICR, which we're calling this proposed plan. Family size is there on page two. Um, support poverty guideline. This is these are all we've been talking about this, so I won't get into it. Borrower eligibility and loans eligible to be repaid under an IDR plan. And I'll stop there to take any uh, suggestions regarding definitions we may have left out. And also another thing we flagged as TK or to come is uh, feedback on the types of loans here and consideration of how loan type eligibility interacts with cost and potentially other design parameters. So we haven't defined what loans are eligible to be repaid under an EICR plan. So we would like to hear from you on that. Again, just to be clear, FEL loans are not eligible under the statute for ICR plans. And I'm already seeing some hands and knowing that we're coming up on the half hour. Uh, Jerry, go ahead. OK, just a, su a suggestion for a definition, and that would be consolidation. Um, that confuses a lot of people. They consolidate many into one and it screws up interest rates. So the fact that consolidation could be moving one loan at a time, I think is important for people to understand. Um, uh, that's what I run into quite a bit is that consolidation term. Thanks, and then throughout this with all the, um, the solicitation, feel free to put any language that you're suggesting into chat. Um, but Daniel, go ahead. So um, I, I'll be quick, but I would strongly urge that we move to one plan for FEL, one plan for DL. Um, and that in, in as much as we can at this point, take the opportunity to try to eliminate confusion um, and uh, the way it sits right now, um, adding another plan is just going to, I think, multiply confusion rather than trying to um, simplify. So to the extent that we can, I would love to see us move to one plan, knowing that we can't have a plan, an ICR plan for FEL loans, an IBR plan for FEL loans, and then an ICR plan for DL. Um, that would be my suggestion. Uh, first, just go ahead. Thank you, and um, I, I unfortunately have a lot to say, so we, I may not cover it all in this part. I might have to get back to it in the morning. Um, the first thing that I do want to say is I, I want, as we're having these discussions, to make sure that we're centering the voices of borrowers of color. It was a stated um, interest when we when this was this rulemaking was noticed that borrowers of color were supposed to be front and center, and I think we need to continue to do that. Um, I so. Uh, uh, Amanda Martinez from Unidos US was speaking um, in the public comment period earlier and ran out of time and she ran out of time on income grant payment. So I would like to read into her state the remainder of her statement. Um, she said, lastly, the income drain payment plan intended to expand borrowers repayment options and support lower income borrowers staying in good standing on their loans is not 
reaching Latinos or providing substantial support, support relief. Many Latino borrowers do not enroll because they may not be aware of their options to enroll in income during payment. Only 18% of Latinos who entered in entered college in 2011 to 2012 academic year, began repayment within five years were enrolled in an income drain payment plan. While being enrolled in an IDR plan can provide an affordable payment option, it can lead to even higher debt over time for low income borrowers who do not get approved for forgiveness. In making improvements to IDR, Unidos US recommends the committee and ed prioritize higher income exemptions and shortening forgiveness timelines. As the department considers issuing new regulations governing student loan cancellation programs and strengthen student borrower protections to ensure equitable outcomes for all students and student loan borrowers, the Latino experience in these programs should be considered in the redesign and discussion. I'd also like, I also hope that everyone has had the opportunity to read the recent report by Ed Trust and Professor Jaleel Mustafa titled Jim Crow Debt, How Black Borrowers Experience uh, student loan debt. Um, in particular, they're finding on income during payment that income during payment feels like a lifetime debt sentence. Um, and about the uh, and according to that report, how many of the borrowers that they surveyed, many of the black borrowers that they served, they, and they surveyed over a thousand borrowers, um, had said that they had a hard time um, of being able to who were in, enrolled in income during payment had a hard time affording to make a savings account, affording health care expenses. They had a hard time affording their rent, child care, and food. Um, for Black borrowers, this is what they told me. For Black borrowers, IDR plans are not easing the student debt crisis. Indicator like increasing seconds. and decreasing repayments uh, suggest that they may be exacerbating or prolonging it. Um, even default rem rates remain high despite the availability of these plans. Um, this is part of the basis for the two proposals on both shortening the repayment period, um, as Michaela suggested, but also changing the definition of the discretionary income threshold to 400% of poverty. Um, and I will resume my comments after others have spoken. Thank you. Thank you. I think actually we're going to try to transition pretty quickly into public comment if it's okay with everyone, but we'll pick up with this exact same section A through D tomorrow um, and begin uh our, our our friday there um so with that if, if we are ready to go kayla why don't you um let in our first uh, public commenter i've already admitted mr joshua queen representing himself good afternoon joshua can you hear me uh, i can hear you can you hear me i can yeah you're coming in loud and clear if you want to turn on your video you're more than welcome to otherwise your three minutes starts when you begin all right, I'll turn it on. I don't know how good this camera is right now, and it's in a bad yeah. spot, but yeah, yeah, it's like under my screen a little bit. I'll try to focus on the camera. All right, so I will begin. Let me just find my keyboard here. All right, so I'm just going to read my statement, um, and I'll begin now. So my name is Josh Queen. Um, I'm an Air Force veteran, and I grew up in a poor environment um, surrounded by drugs and crime and a lot of shoddy people. Um, anyhow, never believed that I would be someone who would go to college. And I joined the military around the time I was 19 um, in order to provide for myself and my girlfriend at the time, um, shortly after we got married. Uh, it wasn't until I was around 25 that I realized that higher education could be a part of my future. I did not have anyone around me to give me a guidance or advice about how that process works. So I basically just decided one day I'd go to college and I was on my own on you know how to do it and what the process is. Um, I attended Westwood College online between 2005 and 2007. Um, I was in their computer science program. It was actually a, a game software, a gaming, it was, like, it was a game degree basically where you would get into the gaming industry and be able to make video games. That was the dream when I was younger. Um, so I joined them for that. Um, oh yeah, I chose Westwood College because I couldn't get the degree I wanted on base. Um, on the base, they only have so many classes. They have a certain amount of colleges that, that supply classes on base, and none of them work for computer science back then. Um, so the online education looked very attractive to me, and that's basically what, what uh, how, how I ended up online, going to online schools. Westwood convinced me that I needed to take out student loans in order to pursue my education. Recruiters claimed that my loans would be very easy to pay off and would be low interest. They did not explain the terms of my loans or introduce other methods to finance my education, such as Pell Grants and scholarships. Um, 
Recruiters also created a false sense of urgency to get me to enroll. I was told that if I didn't enroll immediately, I would have to wait up to three months before I could try to enroll again. I believe they still do that, these um, for-profit online schools. Um, Westwood featured advertisements claiming that they offered game developer degrees that help graduates find work in the gaming industry. After I enrolled, I discovered that Westwood did not actually offer game developer degrees. Um, when I applied for game development positions at companies, my applications were rejected. Furthermore, Westwood claimed that teachers were industry experts who would help me get my foot in the door in the gaming industry. I discovered that the teachers were inexperienced and Westwood provided seconds. teachers okay, uh, provided teachers with templates to, to use for each class. Teachers rarely deviated from this template and were unable to answer basic questions to the point that I did not usually reach out to them. Instead, I researched via school books and Google um, to get my answers because they were not very helpful. In addition, Westwood recruiters lied to me about transferability of my credits. When I tried transferring my credits to Grantham University, only 10 out of 50 credits transferred. The school I'll be attending this year will be accepting less than 10 of the 102 credits I have previously earned at That's Westwood. Three minutes, Mr. Queen. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. You as well. Thank you. I have just admitted Representative Greg Murphy out of North Carolina's 3rd Congressional District. Good afternoon, Representative. Can you hear me? Looks like they might still be here. Oh, wait, we can hear, we can hear someone. Hey there. Hi, your three minutes begins uh, whenever you start speaking. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, this is Congressman Murphy. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. I'm Congressman Greg Murphy and I re represent the third district of North Carolina. I also serve as the ranking member of the subcommittee on uh, higher on education on the education and labor uh, uh, committee. There is a lot to be excited about with this negotiated rulemaking. The proposal to eliminate interest capitalization on student loans will help reduce the finance cost of borrowing for nearly every student. And as a parent with students, um, I think that this is a welcomed uh, uh, initiative. Yet at the same time, the department has several contentious items on its agenda that I have serious concerns about and would like to address. I urge the department to take a step back and consider the long term ramifications of some of these proposed actions. The next president will most likely, given the state of affairs in the country right now, be a Republican president. And unless you want your regulatory work to be reversed, and you should please carefully consider making a more moderate approach that can actually last. The department's proposal to change the evidentiary and reliance standards on the borrower defense claims is really misguided. Under the new proposal, students will not need to show that they relied on misrepresentations in order to have their loans forgiven. This creates a moral hazard where students who are not impacted at all will be able to put their hands up to have their loans forgiven when they truly should not be forgiven. The department also plans to use uncorroborated borrower statements as evidence in its borrower defense applications. Approving claims without corroboration opens the door to fraud. I'm a physician and have had to deal with Medicare for 30 years. Corroboration is needed there and it is ne it should be needed here. There is no mention that the department's issue paper on how it plans to protect taxpayers and institutions from fraudulent applications. We must strike an appropriate balance between providing borrowers that have been defrauded with relief while ensuring that institution and taxpayers are protected from frivolous claims. Unfortunately, the department's proposal is anti-taxpayer, anti-institution, and honestly, uh, anti-student. The department should also look broadly at its entire higher education landscape, ensure that any new rules protect all students in all sectors. Singly out, singling out proprietary sector for harsher treatment is Very unnecessarily seconds. divisive and most importantly does not protect all students. Fraud happens in all sectors. The department does a disservice to students in the public and nonprofit sectors when it creates uneven rules and deprioritizes, and deprioritizes enforcements, enforcements in those sectors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I hope you take these comments into your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Murphy. Uh, Taylor, who do we have coming in next? I have admitted Mr. Devin Renea representing himself. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Renea. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Uh, your three minutes begins uh, begins whenever you start speaking. So go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Devin Renee, and I'm a three time graduate of Full Sail University. Having obtained my bachelor's in film in 2012, my grad C in education, media design, and technology in 2013, and an MFA in creative writing in 2015. I also had the privilege to receive a traditional educational instruction from a four year tutelage environment through my studies and experience at both Morgan State and Howard University, having earned my AA in theater arts in 2010. Prior to my election to seek more of an expanded, customized, creative based coursework curriculum, which Full Sail not only offers to individuals interested in entertainment, but also has been a pioneer for over four decades. My journey after my graduation from Full Sail University led me to the prestigious Television Academy Emmy Internship Program, where I was selected as a production management intern in the summer of 2013. From there, I went on to land a job at Warner Horizon Television within their corporate production office. And after years of navigating the entertainment industry, I earned a position as the assistant to the showrunner of the long running owned scripted series, Queen Sugar, a show produced in conjunction within WHTV and O Network by Academy Award nominated Ava DuVernay and co executive producer Oprah Winfrey. I then landed a writer's assistant position on free foreign network show entitled Famous in Love, and then went on to work later as the showrunner's assistant for the current series Stargirl, created by former DC Comics CEO and Aquaman creator Jeff John. After years of hard work, loyalty, and dedication, I was eventually promoted to creative development coordinator, working alongside my longtime boss and mentor, veteran executive producer, Melissa Carter, where I assisted Carter in her overall deal by developing series content for both network and cable programming for WBTV. While in this role, I successfully aided in selling two drama series, one of which resulted in a network bidding war. In addition to my professional pursuits during my now eight years with the Warner Brothers family, I also presided as the board chair co-president of the Black Employees of WB, which allowed me to oversee employee engagement initiatives geared at strengthening diversity and inclusion all across Warner Media. I have also devoted my time to mentorship with the WB Youth Mentoring Program, HBCU NLA Internship Program, and Nonprofit Foster Youth Initiative, Kids and the Spotlight. 30 seconds, Ms. Renee. I most recently was the script coordinator and co-writer of two episodes of OWN's new long legal drama series, Delilah, and I am currently on Iron Mike's Hulu limited series starring Moonlight, Moonlight's Travante Rose. The dictionary and the definition in the, de the dictionary's definition, full sail is with reference to a vessel sailing with a strong favor of a wind at full speed with sails all set. Well, if life is a metaphor for a vessel, then full sail should be analogous to the wind. I'm living, breathing proof that with hard work. I'm sorry, Ms. Renee, that's, that's Ms. Renee, that's three minutes. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. I have now admitted Sarah Kishevsky. Good afternoon, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Your three minutes for public comment uh, begins whenever you start speaking. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Kilchevsky. In October 2007, as PSLF became law, roughly 8,000 Peace Corps volunteers were serving abroad in various health, community development, agricultural, and education-based capacities. I was one of those Peace Corps volunteers. From 2006 through 2008, I taught English to grades 5 through 11 in Ukraine. Despite having worked towards PSLF forgiveness since 2010, I was not aware until October 2021 that a portion of my Peace Corps service could have been creditable for PSLF. For years prior to PSLF, volunteers were advised by federal loan servicers and Peace Corps to defer their loans, and this is exactly what I did. Given what we already know about the troubled and mismanaged PSLF program, it should surprise no one here that I was not notified by the DOE nor my federal loan servicer of my potentially qualifying service as I was actively serving overseas. And what became of those other 8,000 volunteers, not to mention the thousands that followed us in service? I can quite confidently say that they were not counseled on their loan forgiveness options either. When my Peace Corps service ended in November 2008, I applied for the Partial Perkins Loan Forgiveness available to volunteers. At no point did my loan servicer tell me about PSLF or the transition payment, nor did I come across any online materials as I was doing my application for Perkins Forgiveness. 
Peace Corps service can be incredibly challenging. Volunteers struggle with internet access. Most volunteers rely on phones that require them to pay for each minute of talk time. Some of us have lived without a critical utility like electricity or running water. Transportation is spotty. Illness and isolation are commonplace. We hands down do not have the ability to deal with loan servicing companies while overseas. The recent limited waiver period announced by the DOE will be life changing for so many people, yet at the same time, returned Peace Corps volunteers have been very much overlooked. The waiver period fails to recognize the specific way in which volunteers have been disadvantaged. I have spoken with over 100 volunteers about their experiences. Our biggest concern is that over the years, volunteers have been advised by loan servicers to simply defer their loans. Most volunteers were not counseled on PSLF options, and some were actually given misinformation by loan servicers that influenced them to inappropriately defer their loans, despite being aware of and seeking PSLF forgiveness. These concerns span from 2007 to present. The third goal of the Peace Corps is to strengthen our understanding back home of the world and its peoples. Return volunteers oftentimes spend their lives on this third goal, all while working in critical areas. I ask the DOE to provide us with relief retroactively, similarly to that of the active duty military members with deferred loans and make common sense changes to regulations for future volunteers. I thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your public comment. I have now admitted Jill Anderson. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Your three minutes for public comment uh, begins whenever you start speaking. Thank you. My name is Jill Anderson and I've worked in public service since 2007. I currently am a director of emergency and crisis services at a community service board. I have three college degrees, one undergraduate and two master's degrees. I started my repayment of loans back in 2003 after graduation with my undergraduate degree. In 2007, I began repayment with Sally May on my graduate degree loans, which were fell loans. I was aware of PSLF through my work, but Sally May did not advise me that I needed to transfer or consolidate my loans to Fed loan direct loans. I continued to pay Sally May under the wrong payment plan with the wrong type until obtaining an additional master's degree in which those loans were direct loans. Upon graduation in 2013, when I went to consolidate all loans, I learned that none of my prior payments from 2007 to 2013 counted for my public service and essentially the clock restarted. I also had an administrative forbearance placed in my account that lost approximately six more months of payments. Additionally, with my new consolidation in the income driven plan, my interest rate became 6.8%. I can only obtain my payment information from Fed loan from 2014 to 2021, so I do not have data from what I paid prior to that under my public service from Sally May. But from 2014 until today, I have paid $35,102 towards my student loan balance of $113,545. Not one dollar has paid towards the principal in over seven years. I continued to pay during the COVID forbearance, which so far equals $9,403, which applied completely towards my interest. I still have $4,133 in interest outstanding before my principal would be impacted by my payments. I pay $470 a month. I cannot afford these payments. As I mentioned in the beginning, I'm a director at a large public mental health organization. I also am a single female solely responsible for my expenses. I continue to pay my loans to, during the COVID forbearance as I was unsure if my job would be furloughed or position eliminated and I would lose my chance at forgiveness. I currently am at 88 payments towards forgiveness. I'm unclear if the waiver will assist me in achieving forgiveness. I'm consistently fearful that this program will fail me due, the, due to the misinformation and changes. I would advocate that this committee review interest rates applied to student loans for reform. I would advocate for reform to review Three the cost, cost of living to apply to income driven plans as our payments are often well above the ability to live within our income. I would also advocate that after the waiver ends, the requirement to continue to work in public service after making 120 payments be permanently waived as the financial hardship for individuals to wait for the actual forgiveness to occur is significant. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. We are now admitting Noel Vest. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, Mr. Vest, you have three minutes. 
Hello, my name is Dr. Noel Vest, and I'm a researcher at the Stanford University School of Medicine, where I work to find solutions to the opioid epidemic and relatedly uh, mass incarceration. Uh, I would first like to thank the Negotiated Rulemaking Committee for allowing me to provide this testimony. Uh, now I'd like to speak directly to the efforts to restore Pell Grants to incarcerated students. Uh, I am the proud product of a college and prison program. Since my release in, from prison in 2009, I've utilized the Pell Grant to attain an associate's, bachelor's, master's degrees, and most recently a doctorate in experimental psychology. Today, I'm a postdoc at arguably one of the most, foremost research institutions of higher education in the world. This journey has involved extreme sacrifice, hard work, and oftentimes high levels of discrimination related to housing, education, healthcare, and employment. I would like to take a moment to highlight something that Dr. Stanley Andres said on Monday during the Prison Education Subcommittee's presentation. Specifically, Dr. Andres spoke of the breakthrough students with incarceration histories that overcame structural and systemic barriers to beat the odds to become lawyers, doctors, and professors. I feel that this should be the norm and not the exception to the rule. I tell people often that I am not a unicorn or some type of statistical anomaly. I am what happens when resources are in place to accommodate and foster incarcerated student development. Dr. Andres, Dr. McTeer, and all the many incredible incarcerated scholars that have gone on to careers in academia have done so because at one point we didn't take the advice of someone telling us we couldn't do it. We persevered when someone said graduate school, law school, or medical school would be impossible for someone with a criminal background. We said, no, it wouldn't. I urge the committee to revise the statute so that it does not limit opportunity based on post-release employability in a given occupation. It would be impossible for a prison education counselor to provide accurate information based on the myriad of different state laws on occupational licensing, which I would point out change daily. Uh, I would argue that I'm a better addiction researcher because of my experiences in prison. Please don't exclude people from Pell funded programs <laughs> based on stig stigmatized expectations. Please allow students to utilize Pell to achieve their own dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vest, for your comment. We've now admitted Douglas Roberts. Good afternoon, Mr. Roberts. Can you can you hear me? Hi, Mr. Roberts, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, you have three minutes for public comment beginning whenever you begin. Thank you. My name is Douglas Roberts. I'm a clinical psychologist working in a state psychiatric hospital where I provide mental health services to clients with little or no income. This coming January, I will have worked in public service for 10 years, but I'm still two years away for qualifying for forgiveness under the public service loan forgiveness program. That's because five years ago, my partner lost his job and our household income was cut by more than half. I was on an income-based repayment plan at the time, but because we were not married, his loss of income did not result in a lower payment for me. I called Fed Loan Servicing to ask for help, and I was told that I did not qualify for an economic hardship deferment. The only thing they offered me was a general forbearance, which I took because we were facing foreclosure and I needed to catch up. I did what I thought was the responsible thing to avoid defaults on my student loans. And because of that decision, I now have two additional years before I can qualify forgiveness, even though I continue to work in public service throughout my entire forbearance. And I wanna be clear that I think that this committee is doing excellent work, listening to borrowers and proposing reforms that are going to result in real tangible help to people. The proposal to include periods of economic deferment to qualify for PSLF is wonderful, but I don't believe it goes far enough because most people who are experiencing temporary or unexpected financial hardship do not actually qualify for these deferments. Like me, so many borrowers are only offered a general forbearance. So I urge you to consider allowing some periods of general forbearance to qualify towards public service loan forgiveness, even if it is just for a limited number of months. At the very least, I wish I could ask FedLoan to remove that forbearance and allow me to make some sort of retroactive lump sum payment for some of those months, 
based on what my income was at the time so that I could get additional months to qualify towards PSLF since I was still working in public service at the time of my forbearance. However, as of right now, they are not allowed to remove any forbearances that were requested by a borrower and they are not allowed to accept retroactive payments. I'm so grateful for public service loan forgiveness because without it, I would never be able to get out, get out from under my debt. In preparation for my comments today, I checked my payment history with FedLoan and I found that since January of 2012, I have paid $35,465 in payments. And out of that amount, $520 is all that was applied to my principal. Everything else was interest. I urge you to consider allowing periods of general forbearance to qualify for PSLF so the borrowers like me who face temporary hardships but continued working in public service do not have to add months or even years to their forgiveness date since it was the only option made available to us aside from defaulting on our loans. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Roberts. I've now admitted Jalissa Powell. Good afternoon, Ms. Powell. Can you hear us? I can. We can hear you. Uh, you have three minutes for public comment. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Jalisa Powell and I'm a student borrower who has worked in public service qualifying employment throughout my entire career. I appreciate the department's efforts to improve the PSLF program moving forward and hope that additional changes will be considered for those of us who have been navigating this program for many years. These are the things that I'm strongly asking to be considered for PSLF. Number one, cap all payments at 5% of discretionary income and allow for a cost of living factor in determining this figure. I live in the DC area where my mortgage and daycare expenses alone allow for 50% of my monthly take home pay. The formula used to assess discretionary income has significant blind spots when determining what a borrower can actually afford. 15% of my income to student loans is significant when balanced with other expense considerations. Number two, consider allowing all years of qualifying employment for credit towards forgiveness. The amount of red tape, misleading, and often contradictory information, constant investigation, documentation, and advocacy to ensure account accuracy is frankly unreasonable for the average borrower. For many of us, we were given awful advice by the same people who were supposed to help us navigate through the process, often setting us back many months, if not years, towards forgiveness. Having the burden of proof be on us borrowers to prove that we were misled, all while working in public service, feels like an unnecessary blow. What does proof even look like for the average person who is making a call to get help? Um, it's really hard to figure that out and navigate. If the original spirit of forgiveness was intended to support those of us who were dedicating our professional careers to public service, why have we created a system that requires borrowers to thread such a fine needle to get to the finish line? And finally, implement borrower protection for the upcoming loan service or transfers. Allow any months it takes to complete the upcoming service or transfers from Fed Loan Servicing to the new designated PSLF servicer to count as qualifying months towards PSLF, similar to the forbearance during COVID. Having been with Fed Loan Servicing for the entire duration of my time as a borrower, even this organization, who has been primarily responsible for executing up until this point, does not understand the intricacies of this program. Ultimately, the fate of most borrowers ends up in the hands of the call representatives we get on any given day at any given time and their interpretations. As a borrower, I am sincerely worried about what the next few months hold in store for those of us who fight tooth and nail to make sure our accounts are being fairly and accurately managed and credited with PSLF months. Again, I sincerely appreciate the efforts being made here and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Powell, for your public comment. Who do we have next? I've now added Jenna Jones. Good afternoon, Ms. Jones. Can you hear us? It doesn't look like she's connected to audio yet. Do we want to let in our next speaker? Um, and, and I can message her. Yeah, this is our last logged in speaker today, Bomber Ferrero. Good afternoon, Mr. Ferrero. Can you hear me? Hi, Mr. Ferrero. Can you hear me? Yes, this is he. Sorry about that. I just noticed that there was a, a me calling in for Wi-Fi. Problem. Um, uh, you have three minutes for public comment. 
Awesome. Can I go now? You can hear me okay? Everybody can hear me all right? Yeah, awesome. and if, you, right. if you're comfortable, uh, feel free to come on the video. Okay, sorry about that. Let me uh, take my hat off here. I'm sitting in my kitchen here. Let me take off. Can you guys see me okay? Sorry, I'm in my kitchen. <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You have three minutes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so hi guys. My name is Bomber Farrow the second, and I work for the federal government. I'd like to thank you guys, the committee, for allowing me to speak today. Um, without delay, I'd like to advocate for myself and others who fall into a category who may be left out of consideration for the public loan forgiveness program. I also want to apologize if this was brought up uh, previously. I don't get to attend all these sessions, unfortunately, so this could be redundant, but I'm going to read it anyways. Uh, so upon review of available documentation from the Department of Education's website, there was a recent proposal created by Heather Jarvis. It was submitted uh, for this November session. This specific proposal identifies certain conditions as it relates to qualifying payments to include both deferments and forbearances being considered for satisfactory payment statuses. This proposal would also include both mandatory um, uh, and administrative forbearances. So as it relates to my situation, in 2012, I graduated with a master's degree with roughly $88,000 in student loan debt. So I proceeded to consolidate my loans. I located an employer who participated in the, the public service loan forgiveness program. And I also entered into an IBR because the salary was roughly thirty to $35,000 annually at the time. So initially I was under the impression that my employer um, was a 501c3 who also participated in the program. However, they soon revealed that they would not complete my paperwork if as requested. Needless to say, it was a pretty stressful situation. So a few options that I had, I elected to move into a financial hardship forbearance, which was my it was a huge mistake as it relates to the point I'm going to be getting to. So I, I, I did this so I could start planning, planning for the future without the loan forgiveness and to begin saving money for housing, a vehicle, et cetera, whatever I needed. For roughly three years, I was in the, that specific forbearance status uh, while I was attempting to secure my professional licensure. So maybe one day I could take a better uh, position and uh, be able to pay back my student loans and other bills, which I accumulated while I was in school. So in 2015, after receiving my professional licensure, luckily I was offered a career through the federal government with a higher salary. And now I'm able to make qualifying payments towards um, public the public service loan forgiveness. And I was also able to uh, get out of that hardship for parents. Um, also, I was able to contact my prior um, employer and to find out that they actually did participate. So I was able to get roughly 18 uh, payments towards credit. So uh, unfortunately, as it appears now, I will not qualify or fall into a waiver category for this upcoming forgiveness waiver period. Or after the, um, the this program is updated. 30 seconds, updated. 30 seconds? okay. Uh, coming from the future from this committee. Frustratingly, I wish I had a crystal ball to go back uh, into to rework my request for forbearance. If I would have known that these changes could be coming, I would have went into a mandatory forbearance, which could have ultimately given me three years qualifying payments. So ultimately, um, I would like to consideration for maybe a grandfather clause uh, to this proposal or being added uh, or adding financial hardship forbearances in general to uh, any future language for qualifying payments or to work out a process where we may, we may be considered for this upcoming waiver. Being that, that, I is, that forbearance. That is three period. minutes. OK, that's all I got. Thank you so like much for your comment, Mr. Ferraro. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. I believe that is uh, that is our final commenter for the day. So I do want to thank everyone who logs on for the public comment. We really appreciate you speaking to the committee. Um, and we will pick up with uh, IDR uh, sections A through D um, tomorrow.